God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless you. God, we honor you tonight. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another honor to come before you. God, we thank you for keeping us all day, all night. We thank you for keeping us, Father God, as only you can. Now, Father God, we realize that you are good, you are God, you are the awesome, the amazing, the exceeding God, Father God, who keeps us. You are the divinity, you are the divine, supreme God. You are the one, Father God, who makes life well. Now, Father God, we come confessing our sins. We ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless our lives, Father God, that we will continue to walk with you. Now, Father God, we ask you to bless us in our Bible study. We ask you, Father God, to bless us with your words and bless us to hear from you. And bless, Father God, that your words will go forth just as you intended for it to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. We've come tonight to worship him, to worship the almighty and the awesome God. He's given us another privilege, another chance, another opportunity to come before him. And we honor that opportunity tonight. We consider it an amazing opportunity just to worship and be in the presence of the almighty God. I'm telling you, we don't deserve it, but God has trusted us with his, his word. He has trusted us again with life. He has blessed us again to be on top of the ground. The ground is not on top of us. He has blessed us one more time to be able to breathe, to inhale and exhale. He has blessed us again to have blood flowing to every extremity of our body. And for that tonight, I am grateful. And I am thankful once again, for God has blessed us again. Hallelujah. There is no one able to do what God has done and what God is doing and what God is going to do. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I'm going to call your attention to 2 Thessalonians tonight. Tonight is our first pericope in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 is where we are tonight. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul is given credit for writing this epistle. We want to look at this one again. It is a continual letter that's being written to the church at Thessalonica. <clears throat> we know in these days when Paul was writing, the, the Bible was not broken down into chapters and verses. It was one continual stroll. He just continued to write. And so the apostle Paul is writing to us again tonight. We look at the first four verses, which will give us the first pericope, which is a, a smaller part of a larger pericope. And we will look at the first four verses and uh, see what God has to say to us tonight. Hallelujah. First of all, we see Paul, Sylvanius, and Timothy. First three things that we see are these three men's names. So it says that Paul is the general author. However, Sylvanius, which is Silas, and Timothy are walking with him in this presentation on tonight. So these three are considered the writers they were, uh, uh, Silas and Timothy were given credit for some of the editing as the Apostle Paul is the key author here. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul is the author. We all know that God is really the author of every book in the Bible that has been canonized. We know that God is really the author, but these writers came along as the Spirit of God led them, they began to write. As the Spirit of God unctioned them, they began to write. And as they began to write, we find out tonight we have Paul, Silas, and Timothy. So these are considered the author. When you look at other translation, it will start off by saying, we are the writers. It will say, we, Paul, Silas, and Timothy are writing. So here we are looking at the New King James Version, and the New King James Version says Paul, Sylvanius, and 
Timothy are the authors here. And they are writing to a particular location, a particular body of Christ, a particular uh, group of people in a particular region. He says, to the church of Thessalonica, or the church of the Thessalonians. So he's writing to the church of Thessalonica. He's writing to the church of the Thessalonians. These Thessalonians lived in a place called Thessalonica. So to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father, in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see this assembly. This assembly or this church or this group of people that Paul is writing to, we find out that they are Christians. They are fresh Christians. They are newly born Christians. They are Christians. The Apostle Paul, in this writing, he writes to them because he describes this church as a living body. You see, the church is the only organism that we have. The church is the only, only organization that is an organism. So we have only the church as a living, breathing organism. The church itself is an organism. So the Apostle Paul writes to this church, and this church is described as being in God our Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this church is a peculiar church in the fact that it is recognized as being in God our Father. All bodies, all groups, all churches are not really considered in Christ. There are some demonic churches. There are some satanic churches. But the Apostle Paul points out here tonight that this church of the Thessalonians, this church in Thessalonica, this church is in God our Father. And it's also in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's important to note. It's important to note that, that this church is not just a makeshift church. It's just not a group of people that got upset with the pastor, left the church, and named it A, B, and C. You know, the reason why we have First Baptist, Second Baptist, First Metropolitan, Second Metropolitan, the reason why we have First and Second is because somebody got mad. Somebody didn't agree. We have the Church of God, a Church of God number two. We have A, B, and C Church, and A, B, and C Church number two. We have the First Church and the Second Church. But here we see that the Apostle Paul points out the validity of the church by saying this church is a church in God our Father. This church is a church in God our Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's important that every church that is set apart to worship Jesus, every church that is set apart to worship God is led by way of the Holy Spirit. If you have a church that's not led by way of the Holy Spirit, it's not a God-led church. If you have any church that's not led by the Holy Spirit, does not abide by the principles of God the Father, that does not abide and make Jesus Christ the center of attention and the main attraction, it is not a church, it's a social club. It's a country club. It's another club. It's simply that in the fact that God the Father himself must be the key that holds the church together. If we have a building that we call church, and it's not in God the Father, and it's not in Jesus Christ, and it's not led by the Holy Spirit, it's not a church. Well, you might as well take the church sign down and call it something else. You might as well take it down and call it something else. Because at the end of the day, we need to understand that the church of God is only the church of God if it's led and it is in God the Father. So, so this particular passage finds its way in the New Testament, and we notice that the authors, 
put Jesus Christ on the same level as God. That's interesting. He says, to the church of Thessalonians, the, the church of the Thessalonians, he says, this father, this church must be in Jesus Christ. It makes mention of the fact that God the Father and God the Son are on the same level. Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Son are on the same level. So the church has to be found in Jesus Christ. The church has to be in God the Father. God, the word God here is theos or theos. This is the this is the exceeding God. This is the divinity, supreme divinity himself. It is God the Father that they're talking about. So here we have this church. He begins this, this conversation in 2 Thessalonians the same way he be, began the conversation in 1 Thessalonians. He's reminding them that they're the church of Thessalonians. They're the church of Thessalonica. You are a different type of church because every church is not a faithful church. Every church is not a church that honors God. Every church is not a church that honors Jesus Christ. So he looks at this assembly of individuals and he calls them the church. First of all, the church of God, the church of Jesus Christ, is a church that's in Christ by faith. It is a church that is in Christ by faith. We are a part of the church. We are a part of this body of believers because we have faith in Jesus Christ. And this is what we believe. We believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We believe that that story, the death, burial, and resurrection, is all it takes, all it takes for us to leave earth and go to heaven. Secondly, this church is not only the church uh, by faith in Jesus Christ, it also is a church in the atoning death of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's death atones us of our sins. No other man can make atonement for our sins other than through the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only one who can atone our sins who can wipe away our sin, who can make us different, who can change us over and over for our sins. So the third thing I want to point out here is that this church are a group of believers who are known as the children of God. First thing I said to you is they are of God. The second thing I said to you is they are in Christ by faith. The third thing I said to you, the fourth thing rather, yeah, the third thing I said to you is that Jesus Christ's death is the atoning faith. He, the, the death of Jesus Christ atoned us and got us right. And now those who are Christians, those who believe in Jesus Christ, their sins have been atoned. Their, their minds have been renewed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. His death atoned us. And the final thing I'm saying to you this morning, that we are the children of God. And the only way we are the children of God is because of our faith in Jesus Christ. There's no way to get to God. There's no way to enter in. There's no way to go to heaven. There's no way to have communion with God, but through Jesus Christ. So we have to stay focused on the fact that these Thessalonians, those in Thessalonica, these Thessalonians were new newly born Christians. And because they were newly born, they were in the midst of trouble. Those who were Jews were trying to drag them back into their faith of Judaism. Paul is saying to them, as he said to them in 1 Thessalonians, hang in there. Don't give up. Don't give out. Don't give in. Hold fast. Don't swerve. Don't sway, don't sway. He's saying, keep trusting Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. We are saved through Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. And that he had to write this letter and regurgitate re what he said in 1 Thessalonians because people get weak. 
because people get to a point in their lives where things happen in their lives and they forget about God. <clears throat> Even during this pandemic, there are some people who are walking away from God. There are some people that have fallen into what is known as apostate. They are walking away. There's a falling away. The Bible predicts that in the last days, there will be a great falling away from God. And now the devil has us in a bind, even in this pandemic. He has church folk against church folk. He has Christians against Christians. He has, see, we don't need opposition to fight us because we're fighting ourselves. The devil has all, has even gotten us to a point in our lives where we fighting over masks. We're fighting over whether to wear one, whether to not wear one. We're fighting over vaccines. We're not fighting to get the vaccine. We are fighting whether you should have the vaccine or whether you should not have the vaccine. The devil wants to tear the church apart. The devil wants you to believe that everything that, in, that comes up is a conspiracy theory. That's what was happening in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. Paul continues this same story to tell them to walk away from heresy, to walk away from false doctrine, because you have false teachers all around you. People want to teach false stuff so they can be credited for being the right one. Men teach false doctrine, just as it was then. They teach heresy. They do it in the 21st century, and they are doing it to make you fall away from God. I'm saying to you today, you need to make sure you hold tight, hold strong, and stand firm to God. Stand firm to Jesus Christ. Don't let any man, any woman turn you away from Jesus Christ. Paul keeps writing this letter, and he continues to write this letter to tell them. Look at verse number two. He says to them, Grace to you and peace from our God, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the same God, the same Jesus Christ in verse 2 as he did in verse 1. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at what he says. He says, grace. Grace, the word grace in the original uh, Greek means to be acceptable. He says grace, this word grace means favor. This word grace means benefit. Someone said today the word grace has acronyms and the acronyms means God's riches at crisis expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's amazing grace. The only way we got it is because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It was Christ's expense, the reason why we got grace. It was Christ's expense, the reason why we accepted. It was Christ's expense, the reason why we have favor. It was Christ's expense, the reason why we have all these benefits. Grace, Paul says, Grace to you. In other words, he's saying God's speed. It is, it is God's grace. This word grace means unmerited favor. It is favor that we don't deserve, but is freely bestowed upon us. It is favor that, that we should not be even accepted in the, in the realm of favor, but God has freely given it to us. And he gave it to us because of Jesus' free gift, his substitutionary work on Calvary. Jesus was our substitute. Jesus is our substitute. Jesus will be our substitute. Jesus took our place. He became our substitutionary uh, sacrifice on Calvary. He, his work that he did for us on the cross, we have to believe it by faith. Yes, 
It is Jesus' substitutionary work on Calvary. What he did, he died for us when we should have been dying. He took our place. When we should have died in his place, he died in our place. And we believe that cross death, the death of Christ on the cross, we believe it by faith. It's by faith. It's by faith that we believe it. And because we believe it by faith, God gives man the opposite of what man deserves. It gives us grace. We don't deserve grace, but God gives us just the opposite of what we deserve. We deserve death, but God keeps giving us grace. We deserve judgment, but God keeps giving us grace. God gives us what we don't deserve. He gives us blessing instead of judgment. That's what grace is all about. He just keeps right on blessing us. <laughs> and this grace only comes from God. You can't get grace from anybody else. The judge can't give you grace because God is the righteous judge. <laughs> the teacher can't give you grace because their grace cannot measure up to what God has already done. There is no one on planet Earth who can grant you grace like God can and like God has. So we have grace. And then the next thing he says, not only does he say grace to you and peace from God, our father. The next thing he deals with is peace. And peace is the absence of hostility. Peace is the result of Christ's death. There it is again. We can only have grace through Christ's death, but we can only have peace through Christ's death. We can't, you, you know, you can have a house and it never be a home. You can have a cow king bed and never get an ounce of sleep. It takes peace, the peace of God. And it takes the peace that comes from God. There are two different things here. The peace, the peace that we have is a result of Christ's death on Calvary. Some ask me, plenty of people have asked me, how in the world can you attend your father's funeral and preach his funeral and be so at peace? Well, first of all, it's because it's the peace of God. Secondly, it's the peace that comes from God. And because God has given me peace, I understand real well that peace is the absence of turmoil. Peace is the result of what Christ has done on Calvary. Christ died on Calvary. He did it for you and he did it for me. And because of his death on Calvary, because I believe by faith that when Christ died on Calvary, something magnificent happened. He gave us a peace that we can't get anywhere else. As a result of Christ's death, God and man has reconciled again. You see, man has always, since Adam and Eve sinned, man has always been at odds with God. God disagreed with man and man disagreed with God. And there was a great dispute going on. But when Jesus died on Calvary, he reached up and caught the sinful hand. He reached up and caught the sinless hand of God, reached down and caught the sinful hand of man and bridged the gap and brought them together. Peace is what Jesus demands. Peace is what Jesus has given because he reconciled God back to man. He has reconciled. Now we have peace. And since God has been reconciled back to man, uh, the debt of our human sin has been paid by Jesus Christ. He paid our debt on Calvary. He died for us when we deserve to die. Sinners who deserve to die, Christ died for us on Calvary. He was the substitutionary death. Christians now have peace with God through the death of Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through Jesus' death. If Jesus had not died, it didn't matter who would have died. 
If Jesus had not died, we would not have peace with God. And because of Jesus' death on Calvary, because of what he did for us on Calvary, now we have peace with God. We, we don't have to dispute God any longer. There are, there's somebody listening to me today who's still in a great dispute with God. What you need to do today is tell God, God, I'm wrong and you're right. Because Jesus has already paid the price and you can have peace with God. The second thing that the author brings out, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 2, the second thing he brings out is the peace of God. You see, you can have peace with God, meaning you're no longer fighting God. But then when you're in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of hostility, in the midst of being bullied, you need the peace of God. You see, everybody wants Jesus. When we're going through, everybody wants Jesus to stand on the, on the, on the boat and say, peace be still. In the winds, in the waves, the storms of our lives shut down. Everybody want Jesus to fix it. Jesus, fix it right now. Jesus, fix it right now. Jesus, fix it. But let me tell you, sometime he does not cause the winds and the waves to lay down like babies. Sometimes the winds and the waves keep right on blowing. Sometimes the storms keep right on raging. But the good thing about it is we have the peace of God. And in the midst of the storm, God can make us calm. You got to learn to be calm in the midst of the storm because your faith lies in Jesus Christ. We are in the midst of several storms now. I mean, everywhere you look, racism, everywhere you look, there's a virus. Everywhere you look, there's a new, there's a new thing on the block, a new mutation, and, and there, there's a new variant. Because of the variant, because of the virus, because of things going on, we have stuff going on within us. But we have to make sure we have the peace of God. It's when we get to a point in our lives where we say, God, you're in control, and we really mean that God's in control. When we don't shuttle, when we don't faint, because we know that God is, is really, really, really in control. Let me tell you, God is really in control. God has a way of showing the past presidents they can't handle it. God has a way of showing the present president and the vice president they can't handle it. Let me tell you, God has a way of sitting, sitting down with kings and queens and showing them they can't handle it. God shut the whole world down and God is able to do it again. The good thing about Christians, we can walk in faith with God and have the peace of God. Yes. You need peace with God, meaning you're no longer fighting him. You don't have hostility with him. You, you, you don't have to wrestle with God. You can tell God, God, I'm wrong and you're right and repent of your sin and God will, will welcome you back into the fold. And it only comes through the death of Jesus Christ. Secondly, you can have the peace of God. Meaning that in the midst of the storm, if God doesn't shut, the, shut down the storm, it's all right because I have peace in the midst of the storm. The songwriter says, if the storm keep right on raging, if the wind doesn't stop blowing, my soul has been anchored in the Lord. You got to get to that point in your life where, where you can be calm in the midst of the storm. Yeah, you ought to pray. Yeah, you ought to thank God. You ought to be peaceful in the midst of, of turmoil to, to, with everybody else. But the fact of the matter is, you know, according to verse number two, 2 Thessalonians chapter one, verse number two says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In these two verses, Paul has already said twice that Jesus and God are on the same level. He is our God. Jesus Christ is our savior. And he and he alone can give us the peace with God and he and he alone can give us the peace of God. If your life, your life is in shambles, you need peace with God in order to have the peace of God. 
I mean, you can have peace with God and just walk on down the road and watch what God does. Your favorite statement would, should be that God is doing something I can't see right now. He's working behind the scene. And, and when, you, when you're in the midst of it, you need to wonder, what is God doing now? Because God is doing some things, even though we can't see him at work. Look at verse number three, Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse number three. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows in exceedingly in the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. That's verse number three. Let me see if I can unpack this. <clears throat> Paul says, we, you got Paul, Timothy, and Silas. We are bound. This word bound, this is New King James. The word bound means that we really are obligated. Have you obligated anybody lately? Does anybody feel obligated to thank God for you? The apostle Paul, Timothy, and Silas says, we are at the point with this church at Thessalonica. We are at the point with the church of Thessalonians. We are at this point where we just been burdened. We've been obligated just to thank God always for you, brother. He says that, that we're, we're pretty much obligated. We're pretty much bound. We are at the point in our lives that you have appeared to God, such a, a faithful church, such a church that's walking in faith, such a church that's growing in faith. We're at the point in our lives right now where we are obligated to thank God for you. Can your pastor thank God for you? <laughs> Can your pastor say, ooh, thank God for this one. Lord, thank God for this one. Or can your pastor say, Lord, deliver me for that one. What is your pastor saying about you? If you don't have a pastor, I'm willing to be your pastor. You, what you need to understand is these men of God feel obligated. They are bound to thank God always for them. He says to thank God always for you meaning continually thanking God for them. As it is fitting, it is fitting, it is, it is necessary for us to just continue to thank God for you. We want to thank God for you because your faith grow, grows exceedingly. Check this out. They are thanking God. The preachers, the pastors are thanking God for this church not because they've given them money. Not because they bought them a new ride. They are thanking God. These things you may do, but they are thanking God because their faith is growing exceedingly. This phrase, faith growing exceedingly, simply means that your faith is growing beyond expectation. We didn't expect your faith to grow like this. We didn't expect you to walk with God to the fact that you can have faith even in turmoil. Remember now, they are having turmoil in their lives. They're having tribulation. They are having persecution. Will you have your faith grow in the midst of turmoil? Will, can your pastor, can your friends, can your neighbors say your faith is growing and it has grown exceedingly above what we ask in thought? He says here that we we could we feel obligated. We are thankful to God. We we continue to thank God for you, and it is fitting that we do so. It is fitting, <clears throat> meaning that we don't know any other thing to do but thank God for you. Is your pastor thanking God for you? Is he able to to come and sit in the seat that you sit in and say, Lord, I, I really thank God for this person? Or does your pastor go over to the church? when you're not there, sit in your seat and say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, I, I wish I could thank God for this one, but Lord, I ask you to continue to grow their faith. Where's your faith? King, your pastor says, the apostle Paul says to the church at Thessalonians, or the church at, at Thessalonica, can he say to, say to God, God, I just thank you. And not, they're not, he's not thanking them 
for working around the church, these things we ought to do. He's thanking God. He's thanking God because their faith is growing. Because when your faith grows, work is no problem. I, I, do, I, I do find myself praying, Lord, bless their faith to grow. Now, one of the worst things you can do is be a teacher of faith and not walk in faith. He says, we continually, always, permanently, continually thank God for you because of the growth of your faith has grown to a point where we didn't even expect it to grow. Remember now, they, they are growing, their faith are growing to a point of expectation and beyond expectation in the midst of a hostile environment. Some of us can't even stay at a job because it's too hostile. But these are standing in the midst of their Christianity in the midst of a hostile situation. It goes on to say, in the love of every one of you, all abound toward each other. Yes. He, he thanking God for this church, first of all, because their faith is growing. And then he's thanking God for this church, secondly, because they love each other. They love being around each other. They love fellowshipping with each other. They love participating with each other. They love on each other. If the wine old love each other, surely we ought to love each other in the church. <laughs> the church is slacking on loving each other. The church, some members of the church are acting like spoiled brats at home. I didn't put that paper down there, so I ain't gonna pick it up. It's not my time to wash dishes. It's not my time to clean the restroom. I didn't do that. Some spoiled brats in the church. You don't want me to do that by myself, do you? It's just work. But when your faith is increased, when you grow exponentially, when you grow beyond measure, and when you love your church, you love your church family, you don't have a problem with work. I can look at people just today. I can look at them and tell where their love is. I can listen to their conversation and I can tell where their love is. I can listen to what they say or how they react when given an order, when it comes to God, and tell you how far they have grown. Now, if the same thing is bothering you that bothered you last year, your faith has not grown beyond expectation. If you have an issue with taking instructions this year on the same issues you had last year, your, your faith has not grown beyond expectation. If you have problems with doing just a little work, and here at the New Beginning Church, at the New Beginning Church, some of us hadn't worked in two years, had, has not done anything in two years. And if we hadn't done anything in two years and, and you're asked to do something and you have an issue with it, a problem with it, your faith has not grown and your love for your church, your love for your congregation, your love for your pastor has not grown. If it's you, just say, ouch. If, if it's you, put the shoe on and wear it. If it's you, just do better. Just do better. Just do better. Los Angeles Lakers coach back in the 70s and 80s, asked, he asked the Lakers, the basketball players, he says, just give me 1% better than what you're doing. Just increase where you are by 1%. By 1%. Just increase your faith. Just increase your work ethic. Just give me 1% more than what you're doing. And that team became a dynasty. They walked in a dynasty. Because all of them came together and gave 1% more, just 1% more than what they were giving. Coach asked them to give me 
My challenge to the church folk today. My challenge to the New Beginning Church today. Give me 1%. Oh, yeah. And the good thing about asking for 1%, the coach knew and the pastor knows if I can get you to get 1% more, if you can just do 1% more, you will like being on that plane. You will love being on that plane. You will love being at that level and you will continue to give more and more. And it becomes easy for you to give without pay. 1%. Just, just give the Lord 1% more. 1% more in your faith, 1% more, more in your giving, 1% more in your work ethics, 1% more in your encouragement, 1% more in just speaking well of others. Just do it 1% more and watch what God does with your attitude and your personality. Every time, every time uh, there's a situation on the table and I'm looking and I'm watching and I'm thinking, who can I ask? Who can I get to do it? And then I, if I skip over your name, it means that you haven't given that 1% more. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul says, their faith has increased beyond measure. And then the Apostle, the Apostle Paul says, says to them, not only have your faith increased, you love each other. And you express your love for each other. You don't let your sister get hurt. You don't let your brother get hurt. As a matter of fact, if you are a real friend, you don't let people go down the wrong road and not tell them. You don't let your friend hurt others. I said to my daughter, I said, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be a police officer and you're gonna be a good police officer, don't mistreat people. Yes. And then I said to her, if you're gonna be a police officer, don't let your partners mistreat people. And then my third thing I said to her is, if you cannot stop your partner from beating up somebody, go back and be a pharmacy technician. Forget about being a police officer. If you can stand by and let somebody else beat up somebody or mistreat somebody, police officing is not for you. Yes. Give it up. Go, go back and be a pharmacy technician and, and, and just count pills because being an officer is not yours. Let me tell you, if you are a Christian and you cannot give God all you have without complaining, question your Christianity. If you are a Christian and you can't love people who don't love you, question your mm -hmm. Christianity. If you are a Christian and you can't treat people right who treat you wrong, Question your Christianity. Love one another. Be kindly affectionate to one another. Back home in Mississippi, they said that we had love that ran from heart to heart and breast to breast. We look out for our neighbors. We feed our neighbors. We, we, we nurse our neighbors back to health. My question to you is, will you give God 1% more? Some people... If you gave 1%, it'll be 1% because you had 0% right now. I'm saying to you today, trust God, love others, grow in your faith. Try something you never tried before for the Lord. Walk in faith. The, the, this church at Thessalonica, they walked in faith in the midst of hostile situations. Let's look at verse number four and I'll leave you alone. <clears throat> He talks about them loving each other. Then in verse number four, he says, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God. We boast for your patience. We boast for your faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Look at what he says. He says, we brag about you. <laughs> This word boast in the original Greek is glory. We, we get glory out of you. We, we boast about you. We brag about you. And then he says, we brag about you among churches of God. So in other words, there are some churches that are not doing well. There are some churches that are not walking in faith. There are some churches that don't love each other. But when we get around those churches, we boast about you. My question to you. Is your pastor both boasting about you? Is your pastor bragging on you? Is your pastor glorying in you? The text says that he boasted of them 
He says, we bragged on them, we gloried in them <laughs> among other churches. We let other churches know. That church over there at Thessalonica got it going on. That church in Thessalonica, they love each other. They walking in faith. Their faith is growing. They are not stagnant. They are not stale. <laughs> they are not. They are not walking in the normal stuff. They are not procrastinators. They are walking in faith. He says, "We boast on your patience." You know you can't have everything right now. We are bragging on your patience. We are talking to other people about how patient you are in the Lord. He says, not only are we bragging about your patience, we're bragging about your faith. And he brings this word faith up again. This word in the Greek, faith is pistis. This word faith means, means to believe. And he says that we brag about your patience and your faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So we brag about you. <laughs> the word persecution means that, that people are mistreating you. Ill treatment is persecution. Hostility is persecution. Being bullied is persecution. He says we brag about the way you handle it. He said we, we brag about how patient you are in the midst of your persecutions, in the midst of your being bullied, in the midst of ill treatment, in the midst of being treated badly, in the midst of hostility, we bragging about how you're walking in faith and being patient in the midst of persecution. Some people can't handle anything. Well, you didn't say thank you. Well, you didn't do the right thing. Well, you didn't look at me the wrong way. The guy got killed the other day because the murderer said, I didn't like the way he looked at me. What a chump. I mean, it's just amazing to me that people do crazy things for stuff that means nothing. Paul says, you've been patient. Persecution been all around you. Hostility is always there. You're always being bullied because, and they are being bullied because they have chosen Christ. There are people who say they are Christians that can't handle anything. He says, you, you've been bullied in persecution. And then he says, in tribulation. This word tribulation means afflictions. Tribulation means pressure. Tribulation means burden. He says, you, you've been walking in, in faith. You've been loving each other. You, you, have, you have been patient in going through all this stuff. And even in tribulation, even in pressure. You see, pressure don't make you somebody else. Pressure reveals who you already are. If I get a lemon and I squeeze it, out comes the lemon juice. The juice reveals what I just squeezed. Let me share with you, when you're under pressure, whatever comes out your mouth, whatever comes out your heart, whatever comes out, out, out of you, whatever you do, whatever your response is, that's what's in you and that's who you are. And tribulation and affliction and burdens and, and pressure how you endured. How did you make it? How did you keep going on and on and on and on? You became the same person. Brother said to me yesterday, and it, it kind of, I, I guess it got my attention, but I, 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 I confess that it's true. He said, many times when men get a level of education, that you have, they change. He said to me, he said to me, and this is one of my very best friends. He said to me, you receive a doctoral degree and you never changed. He said to me, you have several degrees and you never changed. And he said to me, he said, you, you move from one level to the other academically and you're still the same. 
Let me just share with you. Whenever pressure is applied, whenever you're successful in life, whatever you turn out to be is what you already was. Just because of a degree, you shouldn't change. Because of hostility, you shouldn't change. Because of persecution, you should change. Because of burdens, you shouldn't change. Because of affliction, you should still remain the same. Because what's in you come out of you when you're under pressure. And it reveals who you are and it reveals who you already were before it happened. Finally, he uses the word endure. This word, in, this word endure means that you're able to deal with it. He says you've endured pressure, you've endured persecution, and in the midst of enduring persecution, 1 Thessalonians, I mean 2 Thessalonians, rather, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, declares that as you endure tribulation, as you endure persecution, as you endure inflictions, you are to wait on the Lord. Be patient, he says. Wait on the Lord. Don't take it into your own hand. He says to us today, as he said to the church of the Thessalonians, your faith ought to grow exceedingly. In other words, when people see you, they ought to say, man, girl, you have changed. You are different. And I'm not talking about the old group that you used to hang with. I'm talking about your church membership. I'm talking about uh, the people who see you walking in Christ when you're walking in Christ. They ought to see a difference. I'm not talking about the man on the street. I'm, I'm talking about people who walk with you in the spirit, people who walk with you in the word. They ought to see your growth. If they can't see your growth, check yourself before you wreck yourself. People ought to look at you and say, you are different. And you ought to respond by saying, it's all about God. Right. And I'm not talking about a, a, a phony fake talking about God. I'm talking about the fact that you have endured. You have lasted. You, 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 don't, you don't pop in and pop out. Right. Everything new comes up. You want to be a part of it. You want to get with it. I'm talking about sticking with Jesus in the good times, sticking with Jesus in the bad times, sticking with Jesus regardless of what other folks say, regardless of the persecution. There may be somebody listening to me tonight who have gotten to a point where they believe that Jesus is the son of God. And out of obedience to God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. You can be saved right here, right now. You can be born again. You just need to trust Jesus as your savior. If you would, just repeat after me and invite Christ into your life so you can even qualify to be a member of the church. Because you don't join church, you're born into church. Would you like to be born into church? Would you like to join this God that we talk about? Jesus the Christ himself has given his life for you. If you can believe that story. Just repeat after me and invite him in. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There may be others who are listening who struggle in this faith. The world has beat you up. you burdened down. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for us. Because if the truth of the matter be told, we all are burdened by one thing or the other. Maybe it's a prayer that we've been praying for a long time. We don't think God has answered it the way we want him to. Let's pray for us. Maybe it is something that we're struggling with that no one knows about. God knows. 
let's pray for us. Maybe you stuck on yourself. Maybe you think that the world revolves around you. Let me tell you, if that you, that's going to come to an end. God has a way of showing us up in the midst of our stuff. If you don't believe me, ask Governor Greg Abbott. God has a way of showing you up in the midst of your stuff. Let's pray for us. Father God, we thank you. We bless your name. We thank you, Father God, that we are saved. We realize that you've saved us for a purpose, and that purpose is to glorify you. We pray that you bless us now. God, forgive us for our sin. We, we ask you to forgive us for those things we've omitted. Forgive us for those things that we've been challenged in and we've failed. Forgive us for procrastination. Lord, forgive us, Father God, for reflecting things. And forgive, us, forgive us for not being real. Bless us tonight, Father God, that we will submit unto you. That you, God, will say that we are real. That you, God, will acknowledge that we walk in faith. That you, God, will acknowledge that we love each other, especially the brethren. Lord, we ask you to change our hearts, change our minds. Bless us to get focused. Bless us to count those things that are major as major. Allow us to stop measuring in the minors that you would get the glory. All the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. There may be others of you who are without a church home or in between church homes or don't have a church home that you can call your home. I welcome you to the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. If you receive Christ tonight, inbox me and let me know so we can celebrate with you. If you repented or renewed your vows unto the Lord, inbox me and let me know so I can celebrate with you. If you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church, inbox me and let me know so, so I can, can celebrate with you and introduce you to this great family of faith. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for being a part of our Bible study. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. You can do that in two ways. Number one, you can mail your offering in to the New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Or you can download, upload, or send your offering, your tithes, your, your sacrificial gifts by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting. Dot Jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting. Dot Jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account is lifting. Dot Jesus at yahoo.com. Tonight we want to pray in our prayer time for those who are on our prayer list. We're going to lift up Chelsea Velasquez. Chelsea Velasquez and her entire family as they all fight this, this dreadful virus. We want to lift up the Velasquez family. We want to lift up the Wade, the Dixon, and the Irvin family. Uh, Brother Larry Dixon and Sister Lane Irvin goes to our church. And their brother passed away. We want to lift them up. Uh, their mother name is Sister Wade, I think she's 99 years old. I want to lift, lift this family in prayer. Funeral services will be uh, this weekend at Greater St. Matthew Baptist Church. 
in the Sunnyside area on Jutland at 1.30 p.m. So we're gonna lift this family. We're gonna lift up the Hemingway and Woods family and my family as they fight this dreadful virus. About 11 of them as they fight this virus and and one of, one of those members of my family will be laid to rest very soon as a result of COVID-19. So we'll lift up the Hemingway and Woods family, which is my family. We'll continue to pray for Pastor Alan Aaron and Sister Deborah Aaron as they recover from COVID-19. Spoke to Pastor Aaron today and, and he's, he's doing better. And uh, we want to continue to lift up Pastor Alan Aaron and Sister Deborah Aaron as they continue to walk and recuperate as they come out of this dreadful virus. We're going to continue to look up Sister, uh, lift up Sister Lula Richard in bereavement and also Sister Eloise Johnson and during this period of bereavement. We're going to lift up Sister Ramona Mathis, who is the mother of Sister Nicole Davis here at our church. We want to lift her up and pray God's strength as she recovers from her illness. If there's anyone that we have not noted, please, ma'am, please, sir, let me know. I'll be glad to include them on our prayer list. I failed to mention the Wade, the Dixon, and the Irvin family on Sunday. I didn't write it down, so I forgot it. So uh, we want to lift that family before, before the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We come lifting up these family and all their concerns. We ask you to bless every member. Heal, Father God, touch and comfort as only you can. Bless us, Father God, to love each other. Bless us to have faith and patience as we go through hostility and bad situation, high pressure. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ, the one who died and rose for us. It's in that name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. We at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.